Here you've got Bene August Fulcher Gabi Akhadov Brehov. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Brehan Academy. My name is Kevin Flanagan. In this video, we're going to be covering chapter five of a story of an Irish sect, continuing our series on the book written by Seamus McNamara, a member of this sect. Before I get into it, if you're a fan of all things Irish heritage and culture, then I invite you to subscribe and like the page because that's what we cover here. The aim of the Brehan Academy is really to promote a revival uh, of awareness of the culture, the mythology and the laws of early Ireland. So if that interests you, please give the page a like. Also invite you to check out the brehanacademy.org website. There's lots of materials over there as well. There's blog posts, uh, resources, online courses. And if you sign up to become a member, which is absolutely free, you can get access to a really huge um, members library, which has a ton of resources, including the book that we're going to cover here, the story um, um, of an Irish sect. This is going to be the second last video of this series. And in the final video, we're going to talk about uh, Brian Baru and the Vikings. Now, there's a lot more in the book, and I encourage you to go and read it, but that's all we're going to cover uh, on this channel. So with that being said, uh, let's jump in to the next chapter of the story of an Irish sept. Mm -hmm. of an Irish sept chapter 5 on the history of the origins of the Dalcassian tribe of the Yoganists of Cormac Cos first of the Dalcassian chiefs in AD 234 the McNamaras a sept of the Dalcassian tribe which tribe was granted possession of North Munster or Thomond they conquered that province from the Iberian race including County Clare in AD 419 and how Iberians then formed a large proportion of the population of Clare. In the preceding chapter I have endeavoured to give a brief account of the people from which the members of our sept were derived, together with the social, political and religious conditions under which they lived until the middle of the 16th century. At that time, certain arrangements were made between Henry VIII and the leading landowners of Clare, whereby the tenure of the land under the Brehan Code was for the first time disturbed. But in other respects, the people living to the west of the Shannon continued to flourish under their old laws and customs until the reign of James I. We may now proceed to learn from contemporary historians something as to the character of our ancestors and to trace the influence which their inherited qualities had in moulding their career. For history is valuable insofar as it enables us to comprehend the causes which have led to the success or failure of the people to which it refers, and to probe the virtues and vices which, as links in the chain, their descendants are destined to pass on to their children. In the case of Irish men, it seems that knowledge of this kind is of peculiar value. The government of that country has been, and still is, a vexed question largely because due weight has not been given to the fact that the character of the Irish Celt and English Saxon differ, and laws and customs which to the latter appear to be unexceptionable are by no means necessarily best fitted for the former people. Working on these principles we must endeavour to discover from their actions in what the peculiarities of the Celtic Irish man consists, and if we come near the truth in this matter, we shall have done something towards laying a foundation on which to base a system of treatment calculated to alleviate, if not to remove, some of the social and political anomalies under which Irish Celts exist. From an abstract of the registered pedigree of the McNamaras, it appears that the family traced their origin in uninterrupted succession to Cass, the son of Connell. But we may go back farther than this, for there is historical evidence to show that Connell was the sixth in descent from a Celtic chief who ruled over the province of Munster from the year AD 174 to 234. This chief's name was Angus. Angus, or Ulil Ullum, as he was commonly called, was descended from the family of the early Celtic rulers of Ireland. He married the daughter, Sabia of a renowned Irish hero known as Con of a Hundred Battles. Ulil, although a less distinguished warrior than Con, was nevertheless a prominent character in Irish history. He was a scholar as well as a soldier. Some of his poems still exist, 
and Professor O'Curry believes that these poems were actually the work of this king. Ulil and many of his successors lived at Cashel in Tipperary, within sight of the hills of Clare. From a strategical point of view, it was hardly possible for the Celtic chief of Munster to have selected a more advantageous position than the rock of Cashel upon which to take up his abode. This rock rises abruptly in the midst of a far-reaching plain, doubtless until comparatively recent times covered by a forest. The summit of the rock is flat and like that of the Acropolis of Athens, capable of affording space upon which to erect a considerable number of buildings, and above all having a deep well containing an abundant supply of water. On the summit of this rock, Ulil Ullum built his habitation, constructed of wood and clay. We know but little of his life, and that little is chiefly derived from legends which have been handed down to us. Among these is the curious tradition which explains why Angus was nicknamed Ulil Ullum, or Doctovanir, as the name signifies. Angus had been engaged at some distance from Cashel overlooking a favourite stud of horses. Night came on and the king directed his attendants to collect rushes and prepare a bed for him on the hillside. Then he went to sleep to the sound of the grazing of his horses. In the morning, to the surprise of Angus, the grass, which on the previous night covered the hillside, had disappeared. On a subsequent occasion in similar circumstances, the same thing happened. As the king could in no way account for this phenomena, he sent for his chief druid to explain the matter to him. The druid, on arriving at the hill, found that Angus was asleep, and he therefore took up his position near his master, and presently saw the side of the hill open, and its denizens, headed by their chief and his daughter, issue from the opening. As the hill chief seemed inclined to approach too near the sleeping king, the druid hurled a spear at him and killed him. As for the girl, the king arose, caught and kissed her. But she resisted, and struggling to release herself from Angus, she nipped off his ear, so that she left him neither flesh nor skin of the same, from which time never any such ear grew on him again. Henceforth, Angus was named Ulil Ullum, or Docked of an Ear. Ulil had nine sons. Of these, Owen, the eldest, and six of his brothers were killed in a battle fought against their half-brother Macon, the son of Sabius' former husband, quote, nursed on the same knee as Owen and at the same breast. End quote. Macon appears to have been a delicate, peevish child, and when nothing else would pacify him, those under whose care he was brought the boy to Ulil's favourite wolfhound, who was so tender and fond of children that young Macon and the hound became fast friends, so much so that he received the name of Macon, son of a hound. When Macon had grown to manhood, he was entrusted with certain duties by his stepfather, and, having failed in his trust, he was banished by the king from Munster. He sought refuge with the King of Scotland without revealing his name and position, and was received on friendly terms. One day some Irish men arrived in the Scotch King's presence while he and Macon were engaged in a game of chess. Macon questioned the strangers as to the state of affairs in Ireland, and then turned the conversation to that of his own family in Munster. Oh, said the strangers, with them nothing goes well. They are under the bondage of women. Upon hearing this remark, Macon seized some of the heavy chessmen he was playing with and flung them at the strangers. A fit of affection, exclaimed the King of Scotland. It is evident to whom you belong. Macon then related his history to the king and sought his help to regain his position in Ireland. The king accepted this obligation and having obtained help from Britain, they assembled what there were of ships and galleys and barges in the coast of Britain and Saxon land, so that they filled the King of Scotland's ports. The troops on board these vessels were placed under the command of Macon and Bain, a Prince of Wales. The army landed in Ireland near the site of the present town of Galway. The monarch of Ireland, hearing of the invasion of his country, joined his forces with those of Ulil, King of Munster, and the allies led by Owen. Ulil's eldest son, 
and six of his brothers, marched to resist their stepbrother Macon and his allies. In the battle which ensued, not only was the monarch of Ireland slain, but also Owen and his brothers. So crushing a defeat was at once taken advantage of by Macon, who marched to Tara and caused himself to be proclaimed monarch of the country. He adopted the son of the former king, and this lad subsequently became the famous Cormac MacArt, to whose opinions reference is made in a former chapter. It was necessary to enter into the above details in order to understand the somewhat complicated system of succession to the throne of Munster. Ulil, before his death, appointed, with the consent of his tribe, one of his remaining sons, Cormac Coss, as his tanist. At the time Ulil made this arrangement, he did not know that his eldest son had married the night before the battle in which he was killed, and that the result of this marriage was a son. So soon as Ulil was assured of this fact, he revoked his former decision and arranged that Cormac Cass should succeed him. But he decided that, as Owen had a son, he or his heirs must follow Cormac as King of Munster, the province being governed alternately by the family of Owen and then by the heirs of Cormac Cass, without quarrel or dispute. The descendants of Owen formed a tribe known as the Owenists and the descendants of Cormac Cos, the tribe of the Dalcassians. Cormac Cos, therefore, son of Ulil Ullum, was, as Professor O'Curry remarks, quote, in a lineal descent the progenitor of the renowned tribe of the Dalcas, which in the course of time subdivided into the O'Briens, McNamaras, O'Carrolls, O'Grady's, and other septs. The McNamaras were known as the Sheil Eda, Clan Cullen, Ada and Cullen having been two famous chiefs of the Sept. Cormac Cos came to the throne of Munster AD 234. He married a daughter of the poet and warrior Ushian, who was in command of the Fina of Ireland, as his father and grandfather had been before him. At this time the throne of Leinster was occupied by a king named Cormac, chief of the provincial king of Ireland. It appears to have been the custom for the ruler of Leinster, as monarch of the country, to summon the provincial kings and chiefs once every three years to a council at Tara in order to regulate the affairs of the kingdom. On an occasion of this kind, the king of Ulster determined to seize the sovereign power. Without warning, he collected a large force and marched on Tara. Cormac was unprepared for this invasion and had therefore to retire in haste from his capital. He then summoned a council of war and inquired of his chief bard as to what steps it were best to adopt in existing circumstances. The bard replied, quote, O Cormac, unless that nearer to hand thou hast some battle-winning friend, then of Munster crave a champion, mighty hard-hitting, a lord that may relieve thee of all fear of enemies. End quote. The king then consulted the chief druid on the subject, and he concurred in the opinion expressed by the bard. So Cormac started off to the King of Munster, the first of the Dalcassians, and at his hand received a hearty welcome. The object for which we are come hither, the monarch said, is to propitiate your good will, which, said the King of Munster, thou shalt right willingly have. And so it was arranged that the forces of Munster should be placed at the disposal of Cormac, the Dalcassian chief, his brother Cian being entrusted with the command of the forces. A desperate battle followed, in which the King of Ulster was slain, and Cormac restored to his throne. But the men of Munster suffered severely. Cian, their commander, the progenitor of the O'Carrolls of Eli, being killed. His son, named Tyg, was also wounded in this battle, and the surgical treatment which he received has already been described. Cormac Cass was wounded on the head, and for thirteen years it is said, portions of his brain passed through the wound, but he continued to govern his province. Cormac Cass built himself a fort on the side of a hill, in the midst of which was a sparkling translucent spring, about which a royal house was constructed, and the king's couch so placed as to allow cold water being constantly poured over his head, which alone gave him relief from the pain. In this place Cormac Cass died, 
he was buried in the hill where the remains of his father, Ulil, and his mother, Selbia, had already been lain. From this history we can understand how the Dalcassian came into existence. They were a division of the original tribe of which Ulil was head into the Dalcas or Sons of Cas, forming one branch and the descendants of Owen the other branch. Of the Dalcassians, Keating, quoting from a very ancient Celtic work, remarks, quote, This was a brave and martial tribe, and it was observed particularly of them that they always chose to be in front of the attacking force when they entered an enemy's country, where they always distinguished themselves with signal courage, and when marching homewards their place was to cover the army and to shield it from danger. End quote. This passage was taken from the Psalter of Cashel, that is, from the official record kept at Tara, and revised by a council which assembled there every third year under the presidency of the king. Mokhorv, son of Cormac Cass, became king of Munster, AD 314. He reigned for twenty years. But, as before explained, the throne of Munster after Cormac's death was to pass to his nephew whose name was Fiacre. Some time before his decease, Cormac Cos came to an arrangement with Fiacre to divide the province of Munster. One part to include what is now known as the counties of Kerry, Cork and Waterford were to form South Munster and to be the patrimony of the Owenists. The other half of Munster, including the counties of Clare, Tipperary and part of Limerick, were to form the province of North Munster, or as it was called, Tomond, and was to form the patrimony of the Dalcassians. That part of Tomond, however, which was included in County Clare, was claimed by the King of Connacht as belonging to his territories and was inhabited by the Fearbullocks or Iberian race. In the early days of their existence, the Dalcassians were unable to occupy this portion of North Munster as they were not sufficiently strong to conquer the territory assigned to them from the people who occupied the land. Fiacre belonged to the Onists, and it is unnecessary to refer to his history. But the legend connected with his birth is so remarkable that it is well to give it. We are told that Owen, the eldest son of Ulil, on his march with the forces of Munster to oppose his stepbrother Macon, stopped night before the Battle of Mokrava at the house of a blind druid called Dil. Owen demanded Dil's daughter, Moncha, in marriage. She was her father's charioteess. The druid predicted Owen's death on the following day but nevertheless sanctioned his daughter's marriage with him, the result of which was a son, Fiacre as he was called, signifying a man of sorrows. Quote, Seeing that on the morrow of the day he was begotten his father was slain and that his mother perished on the day that he was born. End quote. He was also called Broad Crown for the following reason. Owen's widow, Moncha, being in labour, her father Dill told her that if the child were born on that day, he must be a failure. But if his birth were postponed by 24 hours, he would rule Ireland. Quote, True it is, Moncha answered, and for the sake of my child's birth shall be delayed. End quote. Whereupon she entered the river Sir and bestrode a stone in the middle of the stream. Maintain thou to me, she cried to the rock and to the hour of tears upon the morrow, there she held fast. It is time, her father said, upon which she loosed her hold of the rock and reached the bank of the stream. Her child was born, but his mother fainted and died. The infant's head was flattened against the stone, whence the name Mwilahan, or Broad Crown, was imposed on him. To return, however, to Mokhorb, son of Cormac Cos, who after the death of his cousin Fiacre came to the throne of Munster. His mother was the daughter of the commander of the Fina, and her brother Oscar had filled the office of foster father to Mokhorb. After being elected king of Munster, a quarrel broke out between Mokhorb and the reigning monarch of Ireland. The Fina were at this time in revolt and joined the king of Munster against the monarch, who in the engagement that followed was killed. Mokhorb governed Munster for 20 years and died A.D. 334. He left a son called Fairkorb, and he a son Angus, Tirach, or the Landgrabber, 
a name probably derived from the conquest which he initiated on that part of Thomond, now known as County Clare. Lewald Men was a son of Angus, and it was reserved to him to drive the King of Connacht out of Clare and to subjugate the fear bullocks who occupied that part of the country. Lewald, therefore, was the first of the Dalcassian princes who was able to take full possession of Thomond or North Munster, including Clare. We are able to ascertain pretty accurately the date of this conquest of Clare by reference made to it in The Death of Crimen, King of Ireland. From Mr. O'Grady's translations of this Celtic manuscript, we learn that in Crimen's reign there was a great war, and for a lengthened space of time, carried on by the Dalcassians of Munster to win the soil on which to this day they are still planted in Thomond. And this matter was the efficient cause of all the future fighting between the Dalcassians of Clare and the King of Connacht. The latter held this territory as part of his province. From the manuscript above referred to, we learn that Lewald Men was the first that violently grasped this part of Thomond, for which reason he is said to have made Clare sword lands, or in other words, lands taken and held by the sword. The historian adds, the country which the Dalcassians acquired was taken by force, not because they had any title to it, it belonged by right to the province of Connacht. Crimen was foster father to Connell, son of Lewald, and died AD 378. At the time of the king's death, Lewald seems still to have been engaged in military operations in Clare, so we may assume that this part of Thomond did not come into the possession of the Dalcassians until the close of the 4th or the early part of the 5th century. Crimen, king of Ireland, belonged to the Owenite division of Ulliel's sons. He was the sixth in descent from Ulliel, and also was Lewald on the Dalcassian side of the family. Crimen came to the throne of Ireland in consequence of his nephew, the rightful heir, being at the time too young to fill that office. He was an intrepid soldier, and carried the Irish arms not only into Scotland and Britain, but also into the heart of France, and from all these he took hostages and great booty. He left no children, and the succession to the throne was an open question, a fact which his sister hoped to turn to the advantage of her own son. She determined to poison her brother, though it should cost her her own life in doing so. Grimmon was invited to Connacht by his sister, and while there she poisoned his wine. Having first drunk some of this wine, she passed the cup to her brother. The king subsequently feeling that he had been poisoned, and his sister soon afterwards having died, he started for his home in Munster, but only reached Cratlow in the south of Clare, where he died in the year AD 378. His success in arms and tragic death made a deep impression on the minds of his countrymen, so that there can be no mistake as to the date of his decease. Connell, being a foster son of the monarch Crimen, from his boyhood, lived under his care, and the king became so much attached to him that when the lad grew to manhood, Crimen offered to assist him to gain possession of the throne of Munster. The men of that province, however, objected to this arrangement, or to accept a nominee of the monarch of Ireland as their king. They represented to Connell that he would thus be put in possession of that which did not belong to him, for although he was their kinsman, yet he had no claim to the throne, which should, as a matter of right, pass to Cork, a wise and brave prince. Connell agreed to submit the question to arbitration, and the case being decided against him, he resigned all claim to the throne of Munster and betook himself to govern his own tribe, the Dalcassians of Thomond. Crimen had such implicit confidence in Connell that he handed over to his care the many hostages he had taken because we are told he felt that he could rely on the integrity of a prince who delivered up the possession of a crown that he was able to defend for no other reason but because he had no right to it. In a poem contained in the Psalter of Cashel, referring to Crimen, it is said that numerous captives he held in triumph fled, and hostages the bonds of true submission. These pledges and the prisoners of his wars he trusted in the hands of brave Connell. Then whom a prince of more integrity and stricter justice never wore a crown? This prince for arms and martial skill renowned, enlarged the bounds of his command and ruled, with equity, the countries he had won. 
probably this record is the earliest we possess as to the character of one of the immediate ancestors of the McNamara sept. The poem refers to the conquest which Connell's father effected of a portion of the present counties of Clare and Tipperary. As Crimmon commenced his reign AD 366, we may suppose he was then about five and twenty years of age. Connell, his foster son, would hardly have been less than five years old at this time. Probably he was seven years of age, and if he lived to be sixty years old he would have died about AD 419, at which time the Dalcassians were in full possession of Tomond. We have therefore evidence from more than one source which agree in that Ulil Ulium died AD 234, his son Cormac Cos died AD 274, and his son Mor Corub in 334. Mor Corub left a son, Fir Corub, who died AD 364, and his son Angus in AD 383. Angus's son Lewid died, and his son Connell about the year AD 419. So that we have in a direct line from Ulil to Connell six generations, which, on an average, lasted 32 years, and this is about the time which, in Professor O'Curry's opinion, is the period to a lot to a generation according to the teaching of early Irish history. Of these six persons, four were kings of Munster, but under Ulil's scheme of succession, the elder branch of his family came into possession of the largest and richest part of Munster. Moreover, they had not to defend their territories from the frequent invasion of a powerful neighbour as the Talcassians had on their part of Connacht. Taking advantage of the weakness thus caused to the inhabitants of Thomond, the elder branch of the family gradually possessed themselves of the throne of Munster and for many generations became the kings of that province to the exclusion of the Dalcassians who, however, exercised supreme power over Thomond. Connell's eldest son was named Cass or Cass, and on the death of his father he became chief of the Dalcassian tribe. He had twelve sons who were the progenitors of the various sects of the tribe and their descendants formed the families constituting the Dalcassian sects. The territory of Thomond was allotted to the chief and in part to the heads of sects in proportion to their importance. A part of the territory was given to free clansmen for their homesteads. Another part to maintain the poor, old and infirm members of the tribe, and a part was retained as common land which every member of the tribe was entitled to use under certain provisions. We must bear in mind that after Lewitt and his followers had conquered Clare, the county was still inhabited by a brave and industrious people, the descendants of the old Iberian race. Doubtless, many of the fear bulks were killed, and those who remained had their lands taken from them by the conquerors, and were therefore reduced to the condition of serfs. But they were good agriculturists, and we have reason to think a harder working people than the Celts who could have formed but a very small percentage of the population for a considerable period after they had taken possession of the country. There you have it guys, that brings us to the end of that chapter. I hope you enjoyed the information there. As I said, the next video is going to be talking about Brian Baru and the Vikings. I was almost tempted to skip chapter 5, but I wanted to share with you guys the full story, so it kind of fit together. But really, I, I'm excited to share chapter six with you because it's a really interesting part of Irish history. The story of how the Vikings came to Ireland, their interaction with the Irish, and the eventual expulsion of this great, powerful uh, race of invaders, so we call the Vikings, uh, by um, Brian Baru. Remember, you can download this and many, many more books over in the Brehan Academy resource library. Just visit brehanacademy.org, set up a free account, and you'll get access to that. also invite you to check out the online courses if you want to go deeper into learning about the concepts of Irish culture, mythology, and the law. Please help me out by liking the video if you thought it was good. Please subscribe if you want to see more from my channel. Hit the notification bell and leave a comment if you want to start a discussion here. Uh, I love reading your comments. I love answering your questions. And uh, some of you have like very insightful um, pieces of information to add to the discussion. So I encourage you to do that if there's something on your mind that you want to share. Until next time, thank you very much. And Slán Gafal.